Thank you for joining us. Today we have the fourth installment in a series of webinars on best practices for HPC software developers. I'm excited to introduce our speaker for today's webinar, Alicia Klinvex. Alicia is a postdoc in the Scalable Algorithms Department in the Computing Research Center at Sandia National Laboratories. She earned her PhD in computer science from Purdue. Alicia began contributing to the Trilinos project while she was still at Purdue. She's an expert in eigensolvers and has made contributions to several Trilinos packages, including Anasazi, Belos, and T-Petra. Alicia's presentation today is entitled, Testing and Documenting Your Code. As we did for previous webinars, we ask that if you have a question, please submit it via the Zoom Q&A feature. If you are unable to access this feature, there is a link in the reminder email you received today for this talk to a Google Doc where you can ask questions. That link is also listed on the first slide of today's presentation. Also, please see the link on the first slide to make sure we get an accurate head count for today's webinar. Without further delay, here is Alicia Klinbex. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. As Jim mentioned, I will be talking about testing and documenting your code. So in this talk, we'll be talking both about uh, software methodologies, and I will also be doing some tutorials on tools that can help with testing and documentation. We'll start with talking about testing and why it's important, the different types of tests, uh, some vocabulary so that we can talk about how testing should be done. And then we're going to talk about how we do things at Sandia, how we test Trilinos. And we'll talk about code coverage tools, uh, tools that can help you determine what parts of your code are not being tested. After we talk about testing, we'll discuss documentation, why it's important, the different types of documentation there are, how we do documentation at Sandia, and some tools that can help with documentation as well. We are on slide five for anyone who is not able to view the Zoom presentation. The first thing we'll talk about is uh, some anecdotes regarding uh, software testing and bad things that happened because people didn't test their code. We'll be talking about uh, the protein structures of Jeffrey Chang. Jeffrey Chang was a scientist who inherited some code uh, that he used in his protein structure generation code. And the code he inherited flipped two columns of data. It was incorrect. And it inverted his electron density map. So when he ran his code, it was producing incorrect protein structures. And he didn't notice. Uh, so he published these protein structures five different times. And after he, after he uh, figured out there was a bug in the code, he ended up having to retract these five different publications. Not only did this bug in the code damage his reputation, it also impacted the community as a whole because one of these five publications was cited 364 times. So 364 separate publications were based on this uh, incorrect work. Also, many papers and grant applications that conflicted with his results were rejected because it was assumed that his results were correct and anything conflicting with them was incorrect. The second software testing disaster we'll talk about is the 40-second flight of the Ariane 5. The Ariane 5 was a European orbital launch vehicle meant to launch 20 tons into low Earth orbit. And you'll note that I said it was meant to launch 20 tons into low Earth orbit because it was moderately unsuccessful at doing so. And by moderately, I mean completely unsuccessful because the initial rocket went off course, it started to disintegrate in the Earth's atmosphere, and then it self-destructed less than a minute after its initial launch. The reason for this was that seven variables in the code were at risk of leading to an operand error due to a conversion of a floating point number to integer. So they had these big floating point numbers that they were trying to convert to integers, and a 32-bit integer can only hold up to about 2 billion, and they were trying to put numbers much larger than that in their integers. Four of these seven variables that could have this problem were protected by assertions. Uh, three of the variables were not protected, and it was one of those three variables that caused this disaster. The investigation concluded that insufficient test coverage was one of the causes for this accident. And it was a huge deal financially. It resulted in a loss of almost $400 million, uh, one of the most expensive computer bugs in history. The last testing disaster we'll be talking about is the CIRAC 25 accident, which is the most depressing and horrifying of the group. The CIRAC 25 was a computer controlled radiation therapy machine that as, as in the other cases had minimal software testing. Because it had minimal software testing, there was a race condition in the code that went undetected. 
So some unlucky patients ended up being struck with approximately 100 times the intended dose of radiation. Their intended dose was about 200 rads, and instead they were struck with 15,000, which was a huge deal. Uh, you might be thinking at this point that that sounds like enough to kill a person, and you would be correct because uh, there were six accidents with this machine that resulted in death and serious injuries. And by serious injuries, I mean uh, things like people having to have their hips replaced because they had so much radiation. This machine, um, when it was run, sometimes it would produce error codes. And the error code in this particular case indicated that no dose of radiation was given. So the operator instructed the machine to proceed. The operators were very used to seeing these error codes out of this machine, and most of them were minor. The documentation gave no indication that these error codes um, could, that the frequent malfunctions of these machines and the error codes produced in such cases could put a patient at risk. They didn't know that they were killing people. So in addition to this being a failure in testing, this is also a failure in documentation. Now that I've hopefully convinced you that tests are very important, we're going to be talking about the different types of tests there are, starting with granularity, meaning uh, measuring how much a particular test tests. Unit tests test individual functions or classes. They're meant to build and run fast in a matter of seconds, and they're supposed to localize errors. So the point of unit tests is if a unit test fails, then you know exactly what's wrong in your code. You know it is a particular function that has a bug in it or a particular class. Integration tests are a little higher up. They test the interaction of larger pieces of software. Um, for instance, they might test a couple of classes being used together. And then there are system level tests that test the full software system at the user interaction level. We're talking about different types of tests now. There are verification tests, which are maybe the type that we're most used to. These check whether the code implements the intended algorithm correctly, and they check for specific mathematical properties. So for instance, uh, let's say you're writing a Krelov solver. You're writing the conjugate gradient method. And you know that theoretically, um, the number of iterations required to converge is based on the number of unique eigenvalues. And you know that your matrix has five unique eigenvalues. So you know that the specific mathematical property here is that your code should take five iterations to converge given that your matrix had five unique eigenvalues. So if you had a test making sure that uh, your, your code converged in five iterations, that would be a verification test. Acceptance tests assert exceptional functioning for a specific customer. These are generally at the system level. They test to make sure that the code operates the way that customers expect it to. Regression or no change tests are very similar to verification tests. They compare the current observable output to a gold standard, but what makes them different than verification tests is that you have to independently verify that that gold standard is correct. The reason that these are sometimes called no change tests is that this gold standard frequently comes from a previous run of your program. So maybe you run your program, you capture the output, and then you say that is the correct output. And then every test from then on is, does the program still produce that particular output? Performance tests have nothing to do with correctness. They focus on the runtime and resource utilization of your program. Because maybe you've made a change to your code, and now the code, uh, it still works the same way it did before. It still uh, runs correctly, the tests pass, the other tests pass but you've accidentally made it 10 times slower. That's the purpose of a performance test, to um, catch when you make things slower or you make it require more memory. Installation tests are exactly what they sound like. They verify that the configure, make, install is working as expected and that it's putting all the files in the right place. Uh, do we have any questions yet? Okay. So now that we've talked about uh, our vocabulary, we can talk about specific testing challenges to computational science and engineering. First of all, there are floating point issues. You might get different results on different platforms. So if I run uh, some code on my Linux workstation, I might get a different result than somebody else. Hi. I might get a different result than somebody else running on a Mac. You might also get different results on different runs due to the multiprocessor computation. Um, this is because when you have multiprocessor computation, the, the results are non-deterministic. The order of operations isn't uh, set in advance. <clears throat> Ill conditioning can magnify these small differences. So you might get slightly different results because you're using multiple processors and then your final solution could be different or the number of iterations could be different. 
the reason this presents a problem is that uh, if you are comparing using a, if you're running a regression or no change test, and you're making sure that your current output is the same as some previous output and it involves floating point numbers, um, and you're doing a diff of your current output and that previous output, even if your program is still correct, um, these floating point issues could manifest and you could get slightly different results that make your test fail. So if you're doing a character-wise comparison of floating point numbers to check if your test is correct, then that's bad. Another computational science and engineering testing challenge is that you have non-unique solutions to some problems. So you can't check to see if your solution is equal to a particular solution uh, because your solution could be different than some gold standard and still be correct. Another testing challenge is that of scalability testing. It's difficult to get accurate data on a shared machine uh, because let's say you're sharing a machine and you run a performance test at 2 p.m. on a Wednesday and then you run it again at 2 a.m. on a Wednesday. You're probably going to get different results each of those times because uh, there's a different load on the machine. People might be using it more at 2 p.m. So what you could do is instead use a parallel machine with a queue, but getting access to many processors on such a machine is very expensive. And many supercomputing facilities discourage routine scalability testing. Also, if your job is large, uh, we've all had jobs, large jobs sit in the queue for a really long time. Um, in addition, there's the issue of how to scale for weak scaling studies. So in a weak scaling study, you have, um, you're increasing your number of processors and at the same time, you're increasing the size of your problem. But the issue is if you're using a mesh, um, let's say you're generating a larger problem by refining the mesh, then the condition number of your problem is also changing with the size of that mesh. So you're not just measuring um, how things change as the problem gets bigger. It's, it's also a different problem at this point. So that's something that you have to keep in mind when you're doing uh, weak scaling studies. You have any questions? Okay. Here are some testing tips. First of all, the ideal time to build a test suite is during development. This ensures that your new code does not break existing functionality. And also, it's easier, I find it easier to convince myself to write tests when I'm writing the code. If I commit some code and I haven't already written tests, then it always seems like something more important or something that seems to be more important comes up. And the tests can get delayed over and over again. So it's a really good idea to write the tests when you write your code. Failing tests should help you identify what part of the code needs to be fixed. If all of your, um, if all of your functions are system level tests, like we talked about with code granularity, or test granularity, then when your system test fails, it's not going to give you a lot of information about what's going wrong. It could be almost anything. But if you have unit tests, then the unit tests can help you identify what part of the code needs to be fixed. So it's important to have uh, different types of tests in your test suite. Software should be tested regularly. It's a good idea to set up automated testing, preferably every night. Um, you need to develop a consistent policy on dealing with failed tests. At Sandia, we like to use an issue tracking system for that. It's just very important to uh, make it clear who is responsible for fixing a failed test and when it's expected for that test to be fixed. It's a really, really bad idea to leave tests failing for a long time because then the developers get used to failing tests and if they see failing tests, they go, I probably didn't break it, things were already failing. Um, and then you get more bugs introduced that way. It's a good idea to run a regression test suite when checking in new code. We'll talk about this more when we talk about what Trulinos does. And as I mentioned, um, you should avoid zero diffing tests, meaning tests that perform a diff between two different files um, against gold standard output when you have floating point numbers. I've linked a tool here called SPIF, and it's very similar to diff, except that it compares floating point numbers. Uh, it's important to be comparing floating point numbers as floating point numbers instead of strings of characters. So what SPIF will do is it will compare two uh, floating point numbers and make sure that they're within some threshold of each other. And you set the threshold. It's not important to use that particular tool, but it is important that when you test, um, that when you compare your floating point numbers that you do so without using diff. Questions? We're going to be talking a lot about what Trulinos does, so here's a brief introduction to what Trulinos is. It's a collection of libraries intended to be used as building blocks for the development of scientific applications, 
I generally refer to it as Sandia's big calculator. It's organized into 66 different packages. We have linear solvers, nonlinear solvers, eigensolvers, preconditioners, all sorts of really cool things. To give you an idea as to the scale of this project, we have several millions of lines of code. I think it's around 5 million right now. Um, not entirely sure, but it's order millions. We have over 10,000 commits to our Git repository and according to GitHub, 135 contributors. Uh, that number might be a little bit off because we have summer students that sometimes contribute in their advisor's names. But uh, the point is that this isn't a project with five people sitting in an office working on Trulinos. We have many people working on it and it's big. Trulinos has 1,500 tests between its 66 different packages. And we test it in two stages. When we commit, we run a check and test script. And what the check and test script does is it detects which packages were modified by your commits, first of all. And then it will determine, based on that, which packages you potentially broke. So let's say I touch a particular package. I touch XSDK Trulinos, the package that contains the interfaces between Trulinos, Petsy, and Hyper. Nothing else in Trulinos depends on that package. So when I touch that thing, all I can break is that particular package, XSDK Trulinos. So when I run the check-in test script, it will only test XSDK Trulinos. However, if I modified a different package instead, like if I modified um, T Petra, the linear algebra package containing the matrix vector product and the dot products, norms, things like that, then by touching T Petra, there are a lot of things that I could have broken. So the check and test script will determine I could have broken T Petra itself, I could have broken the eigensolver package, I could have broken the linear solver package, anything that depends on T Petra. So the check and test script is smart and it will determine the things you potentially broke and then it will configure, build, and test those packages. If it succeeds, it pushes to the repository, and if it fails, it reports exactly why it failed. So if it failed during the build stage, it will uh, give you the error produced by your compiler. If it fails during the testing, then it will tell you exactly which tests failed, and then you can run them manually and see what they produced. The, tech, the check and test script is really nice for ensuring that your changes don't break somebody else's package. Um, I don't know about you, but I kind of have tunnel vision and I only see my package. I don't necessarily think, see the things that I could break. Uh, so maybe I'll make a change to something and accidentally break the optimization package that I've never used in my life. So that's not necessarily a thing that I would test on my own without the check and test script. Uh, so it's nice to have the check and test script to fall back on to, to make sure that I don't break things that um, I wouldn't even think about. The tech and test script can take a long time to complete uh, based on what packages you touch, but many people run it overnight and it's not really a huge deal. A lot of us are just in the habit of uh, running it right before we leave for the day. In addition to the check and test script, we also have automated testing on a variety of different platforms. Um, you might be wondering why we do this automated testing if everyone uses the check and test script. And the reason is it tests different things. So it might use a different set of packages. And as I mentioned, the check and test script is smart. It will figure out the packages you could have potentially broken, but there are certain types of errors that it won't catch. Like if you accidentally introduce a new dependency um, on a different package, it might not catch that. But the check and uh, the automated testing, it might be testing with a different set of packages. So it will detect that you accidentally introduced this thing. It might also uh, test different environments. So maybe you made some changes that worked with the Intel compiler you're using on your machine, but it breaks the GNU build. The automated testing will detect that. Uh, maybe you made a change, somebody recently made a change that worked with GNU 4.9 and absolutely no other versions of GNU. So they ran their check and test script, they used GCC 4.9, and then everything else broke. But it's okay because we detected it that same day because of the automated testing. We have a question? Yep. Um, Alfred asks, the idea of testing is that you are comparing your output to something that you know, namely some gold standards, mm -hmm. but the point of research is that you are looking for something that you don't know, something that, you, that does not have any previously established standard. So when your code gives you something new or something that you do not expect, how do you know whether it is a bug or a new discovery? Um, very good question. So I don't know exactly what area you work in, but Maybe in your area, there's a way to check whether an answer is at all plausible. Um, 
outside of Trulinos, I, I also used to work on a, a project involving um, graphs, uh, graph clustering. And in that case, you don't necessarily know, um, you don't necessarily know what the correct solution should be with real problems. So sometimes we would also use synthetic problems and we would use synthetic problems in the testing problems that we generated ourselves and therefore knew what the answer should be. Uh, you can do something like that, generate uh, synthetic problems to test yourself. Um, yeah, very good question. Anything else? Okay. So the automated testing, it might also test different environments. I, I don't work on a Mac, so every so often I will break things on Macs and not realize it until I look at the automated tests. Um, I break things with CUDA as well because I don't use CUDA on my machine. Everything okay? Yeah, okay. Um, the other nice thing about the automated testing is that it identifies a small set of commits that could have broken a build or test. At Sandia, we average about 12 commits to Trilinos per day. So even if we didn't have the continuous testing, if we just had the nightly testing, um, if we had a test that was succeeding on Sunday and then suddenly started failing on Monday, we would know that one of those 12 commits broke that, broke that test. Um, Trillinos is big, we have 66 packages, so usually when you look at those 12 commits, it's pretty clear uh, which one of them broke the thing and who it was that broke the thing. And the purpose of identifying the person who broke the thing isn't to shame them. It's, uh, we wanna identify the person who broke it so that they can unbreak it because they're usually going to be the ones that know how to fix the thing. The automated testing of catches a lot of bugs early, which is nice because bugs are easier to fix if they're caught early. Um, I know that if, if I broke something on a Tuesday and then somebody told me on Wednesday that I broke the thing, then I would remember what I did and I'd remember how I broke it and how to fix it. But if I broke something in September and then we're notified in March that I broke it, uh, I probably wouldn't remember what I was doing in September. We're going to skip uh, these slides. They provide examples of using the Trulinos check-in test script and the automated testing. Um, we don't have time to do that during this presentation, but the slides are available on the OLCF website. So you can look at them there. We are going to be skipping to slide number 33. How do you motivate somebody to write all these tests? As I mentioned, we have 1,500 tests in Trilinos, which sounds like a big number. Um, the way that I was motivated to start writing tests when I got hired at Sandia was my manager took me aside and said that it's important to write tests because the tests protect you personally from other people breaking your code. Um, the general policy at Sandia is that if you break the code, then you are responsible for fixing it. And we're not jerks, we'll help each other but it's, it's good to have somebody that's officially in charge of fixing the thing. It's also important to keep in mind that we didn't just pull those 1500 tests out of thin air. You might already have some laying around. Uh, the tests that I used for the Eigen solvers in Trilinos, a lot of them were adapted from drivers I had uh, for generating conference and paper results and for uh, generating results for my thesis. All I did is I took the problems that I was already running on, I reduced the size, and then I made those tests. You can also get uh, tests from user submitted bugs. That's the thing that we like to do. Uh, you can generally ask the user when they submit a bug for a file that reproduces the issue. And a lot of users are great about giving you files to reproduce that. And then those files make great regression tests because you fix the thing and then you have a test to make sure that you don't accidentally reintroduce the same bug. You can also take examples that you already have for your code at, at a pass fail condition and then all of a sudden you have a test. Question? question. Mm -hmm. um, one, the first question is, how are issues that require more than one day to unbreak handled? Are commits reverted and then recommitted, or is there a known failure mechanism? I like that you also called it unbreak um, instead of fix. So how are issues that require more than one day to unbreak handled? Um, well, some issues aren't as urgent as other issues. There, there are things in Trulinos where I've broken something and gotten an email saying, hey, if you could fix this by the end of the week, that would be great. Not everything needs an instant fix. Um, 
are these commits reverted and then recommitted? I don't think we generally uh, uncommit things uh, unless they're a really, really big deal, like things that are breaking the build. Um, in general, if we have a failing test, then that test can just fail for a couple days and it's, it's okay as long as somebody's fixing it. Uh, you have another question? Um, I'm trying to figure out. Okay, it's just a comment um, saying that the method of manufactured solutions could be helpful for code verification tasks under such situation. I think this is in reference to the first question. Yes. Okay. Um, somebody said the method of manufactured solutions could be helpful for code verification tasks under such situations. Um, I think they're referring to the issue somebody else was asking about where you want to test your code, but there's, you don't know a good way to test your code. Uh, the method of manufactured solutions would depend on your research area. With the graph clustering, what we did is we generated synthetic problems where it was really, really obvious what the clusters should be because we generated them ourselves. So maybe your particular research area has something that you could do like that. Anything else? Okay. So at this point, hopefully you're convinced that uh, testing is important and you know how to write tests now, you know the different types of tests, but you don't know necessarily um, what parts of your code could use more testing. There are these things called code coverage tools, which uh, expose parts of the code that aren't being tested. One such tool is GCOV, which is a standard utility with the GNU compiler collection suite. Uh, I'll be talking about Linux tools in this talk because I figured a lot of us are probably Linux users, but there are similar tools for Mac and Windows. So what GCOV does is it counts the number of times each statement in your code is executed. And there is a graphical front end for GCOV called LCOV that I'll be showing you how to use. This is how you use LCOV. First, you compile and link your code as you normally would, except you add an extra flag called coverage. Uh, it's a really good idea to disable optimization when you do this as well, because if you don't disable optimization, what GCOV does is it counts the number of times each uh, instruction was executed. And depending on your optimization, maybe several lines of code were combined into a single instruction. So for the purposes of getting uh, output that makes a little more sense, you should probably disable optimization. After you compile and link, you run your test suite, and then you generate the coverage data using LCOV, then generate HTML output using GenHTML. And I'll be doing a tutorial showing how to do these things. Okay, so here's a simple example. I have a function called isEven that does exactly what you expect it would do. It takes in an integer and finds out whether that integer is even or odd and returns a Boolean accordingly. And I really want this function to work, so I made a test um, that is shown on the left that uh, checks whether eight is even or odd. And if it says, if my function said that eight is even, then the test passes. If it says that eight is odd, the test fails. So what we're going to do with this code is we first compile and link with the coverage flag. Um, there's nothing special going on here. We run the test. I ran it manually because there's just one test, but if you have some sort of testing mechanism, like you run a script or you run a C test, then you can do that too. After you run the test, you collect the coverage data using LCOV. There are many different uh, options for LCOV. Here I specified that we are going to capture the data in the current directory and we're going to send it to an output file called evenexample.info. After we collect that coverage data, we generate HTML output using gen HTML. And here we just specify where we're getting the information and where we're going to put the HTML files. So here's what that looks like. We have a uh, code coverage report in this window. And we see here that uh, we have some statistics about how many lines of code there were, um, how many lines got executed, how many functions there were, how many functions got executed, and then we see the two different uh, files that were involved in this project. We're interested in is even.hpp, so we're going to click on that one. Is even.hpp had four lines of code and we executed three of them. So we covered 75% of the code. And if we look at the um, syntax highlighting here, we see that uh, the function was called once. That's what the one here means. We checked this condition once. The condition was true once, and then we never checked the other condition. Uh, we never handled the false case. We have no idea if false was working or not. 
I mean, looking at this code, this code is simple, so we know, but for more complicated code, we would not know if this line were correct or not. So what we're going to do is we're going to add another test. And this test is the same as the other one, except that we're testing the number 7 now to see if 7 is even or odd. And if 7 is odd, then we say that the test passed. So as before, we compile and link with the coverage flag. We run the test. And then we collect coverage data for both the tests using LCOV. Once again, we generate HTML output using gen HTML. Now we see a co coverage report that looks very similar to the last one, except that we now have three files here instead of two. We're still interested in is even.hpp, so we're going to click on that one again. This time we see that we have out executed all four lines of code. We called the function twice, we checked the condition twice, the condition was true once, and it was false once. So we have now executed every single line of that function. You might be thinking at this point that it's really easy to run that tool for a simple example like that, but maybe for um, real code, it would be much more difficult. So we're going to find out. We're going to be running the, um, we're going to be running LCOV on XSDK Trulinos, which is a package of the Trulinos library de developed at Sandia as part of the Ideas project. This package contains the interfaces between Trulinos, Petsy, and Hyper. Uh, shameless plug, this is my code. It's publicly available here. Go download it, have fun. So the way that we test it is we have 10 automated tests, which are run nightly. And as I mentioned before, um, you can take examples and turn them into tests. And that's where most of our tests come from. They are converted examples. We want to see, though, did I leave anything out of the testing? So the first thing we do is compile and link with the coverage flag. We use uh, ctest for this, or I'm sorry, we use cmake for Trulinos to build it. So we take our CMake file and we add the coverage flag to it. That's all. Quick question. Quick question. Is covering every line of code the goal of testing? Is covering, is covering every line of code the goal of testing? Very good question. Um, I would say that is not the goal of testing. I don't personally, uh, I don't care about the statistics that are provided by GCOV and LCOV. I really just want to see, are there lines of code that I'm not testing that are really, really important? And I'm going to show you an example here of a particular line of code that I'm not testing that's really, really important. Okay. One more question. One more question. Do you know if other compilers have the similar support as the coverage analysis option? Um, other compilers. Do they have similar support to the coverage um, analysis? Uh, yes. I can't remember what the other flags are apart from dash dash coverage, but there, there are similar flags. Um, and I know that you can do this sort of analysis using Visual Studio. Um, you can do this sort of analysis on a Mac. Um, it's, this isn't a thing that you can just do on Linux using uh, GCC and whatnot. Is that it? Yep. Okay. So we've added our coverage flags. Continuing on, we build Trilinos as normal uh, because we're using CMake. We run the configuration script, and then we do make. This will also build the Trilinos tests because the configure file includes these lines that enable tests. Next, we run the tests using ctest because we're using CMake. And it's important to note that this is not prohibitively slow. We've slowed down the code a little bit, but these tests are all still completing in a matter of a couple of seconds. And in the end, we ran all of our tests in less than 30 seconds. We also see that all of the tests passed. Yay, that's a good sign. One more. One more question. Um, back to the question you just answered. Yeah. Um, how about support for other languages, especially for Fortran? I, I don't know about Fortran, but I have to imagine there are similar tools for other languages. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if you heard the question. Uh, the question was, is there support for other languages doing this, um, especially Fortran? And the answer is, I'm not sure, but probably. Um, I know there, there are definitely tools for other languages. I'm pretty sure Java has one. Uh, I don't know about Fortran, but I would say probably. Okay, so now we're going to collect coverage data for the test using LCOV, and this is the exact same line that we had before. The only difference is that in this step, LCOV is going to produce 634 files, so it will take a couple of minutes. And by a couple of minutes, I really mean just five minutes. After that, we generate the HTML output using gen HTML. 
this step will also take a few minutes because of the large number of files it's handling. Trulinos is very big. But here's what we end up with. Um, there are a lot of files, and I just narrowed it down to the ones that are in the Petsy source, the ones that are included in our Petsy interface. And we're going to take a look at this particular uh, file here, Belos Petsy Solver Manager.hpp, because that's the file that has the solver interface. Um, what that file does is it allows you to call Petsy linear solvers from Trilinos, which is a neat feature. Okay, so that file is about a thousand lines of code. We're just going to look at this one particular function, and this function is for applying the preconditioner. Um, we see immediately that there's something wrong because, uh, because of the highlighting here that one line of code is in bright red and the rest are all in blue. Most of these lines of code were executed 192 times, and this one was executed zero times. So we're going to zoom in on that line of code. Um, here we're performing the multiplication of the preconditioner times the vector. Um, we tested the left preconditioning branch. We tested that 192 times, or we executed it 192 times. I never tested the right preconditioning branch. I care about right preconditioning working, so that's a thing that uh, definitely needs to be tested. Uh, somebody asked earlier about whether every single line of code needs to be covered. No, that's unrealistic. You're never going to cover every line of code. Um, you just need to make sure that you cover the really important ones. So you might have seen um, in the statistics before that this file, um, there were many lines of code that weren't being covered. Most of them weren't terribly important. This one is important. Th there needs to be a test for the right preconditioning branch. OK, so any more questions about testing before we move on to documentation? No, but I do encourage anyone who might know a little bit more about the support for Fortran um, in reference to the last question to go ahead and uh, let me know over Q&A and uh, we can share that knowledge with the rest of the listeners. Uh, did somebody just share that? Um, it's a URL. Yes, so as a reminder, we like these sessions to be interactive. So if you have anything to add to things that I've said, if you disagree with me, or if you, um, if you know of a tool that I don't know of, then feel free to add it to the Google document or put it in the chat. I believe somebody posted a URL. I'm not sure how to get that out. Okay. Um, yes, so when you answer that, uh, mark it as answered, and then it will be available to everyone. Okay. Uh, somebody just posted a question with a URL in it, and I believe that might be the answer to the earlier question about uh, tools for Fortran. So if you look at the Q&A, then you, you might see that uh, URL. Okay, we're going to talk about documentation now. First of all, why is documentation important? Uh, we already mentioned a case where documentation could have possibly saved lives if, um, if that radiation therapy machine had better documentation, then the operators would have known that they were actually killing people and they would have stopped killing people uh, before the machine ended up being recalled. So documentation is important to identify the purpose of the software and its requirements, also to clarify what each component does, what's needed to maintain it, and how it can be reused elsewhere. Documentation is important for providing user support. Uh, what I mean is this minimizes unnecessary handholding of users. Let's say it's um, moderately difficult to install your software and you keep having users ask you, how do I install this thing? At some point, it's just easier to document how to install the thing so you don't have to keep um, working with each user one by one and telling them this is how you install the thing. Documentation is also important to ensure that software is used within its region of validity, minimizing the possibility of producing spurious scientific results. Um, example. So when I wrote some eigen solvers for Trilinos a couple years ago, um, those eigen solvers only worked for symmetric matrices. And I believe they only worked for real matrices. There was no theoretical reason why they shouldn't work for complex. Um, I just never added the support for complex. So it's really important to document that we don't support complex because what if somebody tries to use it and then gets bad results because they don't know that I never implemented uh, complex. Um, then it makes me look bad, it makes them look bad, it makes the algorithm look bad. So you need to make sure to document um, what your software requires. 
these are the different categories of documentation. Most of us, when we think of documentation, we think of user guides, but that's not the only type. Um, there are also reference manuals, which list the interfaces and routines and explain their functionality. These can be generated automatically from code. There are readme files. That's a type of documentation. Um, just a simple, small readme file that's lying in the source code directory. There are installation guides, which uh, help users install things, and also tutorials, which sometimes we, we don't think about as being a type of documentation. So what I'm getting at here is that all software needs documentation, but that documentation doesn't necessarily need to be a user guide. Um, it might make more sense for a smaller project with just a few people involved to have a readme or a small reference manual. It might not need like an 80 page user guide. How does training us handle documentation? Each of the packages does it differently. Some of our packages have user manuals, like Mulu has a beautiful one, um, Aztec OO, the Tefos reference counted pointers. And we also have publicly available tutorials, presentations, and slides. Cocos especially has a wonderful publicly available tutorial on GitHub. Um, they're not technically part of Trulinos anymore, but I still like to include them. We also have well-commented examples in a lot of our different packages and we have automatically generated HTML documentation. Any questions? No. Okay. This is how we uh, generate our documentation for Trilinos. We use Doxygen, which is one approach to producing reference material, reference manual-like documentation. It automatically generates HTML documentation from comments in the source code, which means it's easy to update the, doc the documentation when your source code is updated because you're already there anyway just scroll up a tiny little bit and you can modify the documentation. Um, I'm going to be talking about Doxy Wizard, which is a GUI front end for Doxygen since we've already established that I like GUIs. Here's a simple Doxygen example. We're going to document my is even function from before because I'm really proud of it and I want people to be able to use it. So up here we said that uh, this file is called is even.hpp and it contains a function for detecting whether numbers even or odd. I listed myself as the author so that I can take credit for my work. And then I said that there are two examples for um, using this code. Down below, we have the, uh, the comments describing this function. Um, here's the description of what the function does. It has one single parameter called x, which is an integer that can be even or odd. And here's what the function returns. It returns true if x is even or false otherwise. I've also decided that I'm going to create an index page um, so that the user has a nice place to go to look at this documentation. I created the index page by using the main page command um, and I called my page even odd a revolutionary new function because I was very, very excited about it. Uh, the main page has one section called introduction and this page provides the documentation for that even odd project. Okay, so now that we have our comments in place, we are going to run Doxy Wizard. When we open up Doxy Wizard, it's going to ask us to specify where Doxygen will run. I told it to run where I have the source code, give a name to the project, um, tell it where the source code lives, and then tell it where to put the uh, HTML files. And I said put them in a, a folder within this uh, directory. When we go down to output, um, we have the option of generating HTML files and LaTeX files. I'm, I'm having it generate both. It will generate a web page for us as well as a reference manual. I won't show the reference manual, but that's, that's also another thing that you can generate with Doxygen. Okay, then we go over to the expert panel, which isn't as terrifying as you would expect it to be. Um, over in input, we say that this is where the input is going to come from, and we're going to be looking at .hpp files and .doc files. Ignore everything else. We scroll down further and tell it, um, yes, my code has some examples. They live in the current directory, and the examples are called something example.cpp. I think I called them even example and odd example.cpp. Okay, so after we've done all that, we go over to the run tab and we click run Doxygen to run it, and we see that uh, Doxygen completed successfully. Then we click on the show HTML output button to see what it gave us. Here's what it gets us. We have um, uh, the intro page that I described before, describing what even odd is about. If we click on files, we'll pull up the information about um, 
is even.hpp. So here's the information for isEven.hpp. Um, it gives us the option to go to the source code. It lists the functions that are in this file, and then it gives the detailed description that I put in the comment for that file. So we're going to go to the source code. This is what the source code looks like. Uh, no secrets here, except that uh, it did remove all of the docs.json comments because the user just isn't going to want to see it, and it'll possibly confuse them. Um, it provided nice syntax highlighting, so this is very readable. Uh, we're going to go back to the documentation for this file to see the documentation for the isEven function. Down at the lower left, we see the documentation for isEven, and in the upper right, we see the uh, comments that were used to produce that documentation. I said up here that uh, we were going to detect whether an integer is even or odd, and then that uh, description is copied down here. The parameters were copied here, and then it also uh, details what the function returns. It also says that there are two examples because we listed them in the, doc in the uh, comments as well, even example.cpp and odd example.cpp. And if the user clicks on these, they can pull them up and look at those examples to hopefully understand the code better. Do we have any questions about documentation? Nope. Okay. So in summary, testing and documentation are very, very important. There are many different types of tests that you should be including in your test suite. Um, make sure not to have all system level tests. You need to have at least some unit tests to uh, tell you what things are going wrong. Fortunately, there are tools that help with testing and documentation. Uh, code coverage tools can help you figure out where the existing testing is insufficient. We also learned today that documentation doesn't have to mean a user manual. Um, there can be a lot of different types of documentation and there are tools to help you generate it, such as Doxygen. Do we have any questions before the end of this talk? There's none currently. Okay. But I would do give a second for people to maybe ask them. I just wanted to mention that um, if you wanted the link for the Fortran support, um, that is also posted in the Google Doc. Uh, it's also, the link is also in the webinar chat. Um, if if you're looking at that too. And so far, no more questions. Okay. Um, Jim, would you like to introduce the next webinar? Sure. Um, first of all, thank, thanks, Alicia. That was very good. Um, I want to remind everyone that the slides and video for today's presentation are going to be available through the OLCF webpage where you registered for the webinar series and that the videos for all of the webinars are, will be posted on YouTube through the NERSC training channel. Uh, the next webinar in the series, the fifth installment, is how the HPC environment is different from the desktop and why. That will be on July 14th at the same time. The presenter will be Catherine Riley. Um, we also want to encourage you, uh, if you have feedback on this presentation, including ideas for future webinar topics, to send your feedback to the Gmail address listed near the top of the slide. All right, we have uh, one more last minute question. Um, is it useful to use the author field considering a file will undergo many revisions and the actual contribution of a particular author can be lost in revisions. Do you use a repo info for that? Do you use the repo info for that? Um, good question. So there are a lot of uh, different fields in Doxygen that uh, some of them I use regularly, some of them I don't use. Author, I just used for this example. Um, in practice, we don't always use that for Trulinos. Um, some files we use it for just because it's nice to, if it's clear that the file will have one owner, it's a good to be able to be able to contact that one person, the person who wrote it and would know the most about it. But no, I, I wouldn't say that that's one of the most essential fields. Do you use the repo info for that? Do you use the repo info for that? Um, I don't know if there's an automated way to do that. Uh, if somebody knows and they would like to post it in the chat or on the uh, Google Doc, I would really appreciate it. I, I don't know if there's an automatic way to do that, but that would be really nice. Any other questions? Okay. 
All right, so the, there aren't any more questions. So I wanna remind everyone one more time, please make sure you get counted. There's a link at the top of the last slide. And if you haven't registered for this webinar series and you would still like to, please do so. There's a link at the bottom of the slide. Thank you everyone for attending today.